I'll be uh, reading that chapter in just a moment. Uh, I love the book of Ruth. It's a good study, and I encourage you, uh, if you have not read it, or had not read it in a while, read the whole book. It doesn't take very long, and it's a great story. It, uh, it takes place during the time of the judges, and probably the second generation. That first generation, you know, they followed the Lord uh, greatly after they crossed Jordan. They had been in the promised land. They had been in the wilderness 40 years, and, and they'd come out of that, and they'd seen God's miracles and, and, uh, from Egypt and stuff. And this second generation started moving away from God. And in, and in Judges, it says there that uh, men did what they, thought was, what they thought was right in their own eyes. Now, you know, it's something like America today. People do what they think is right in their own eyes. But uh, here in this uh, book, during the time of the uh, Judges, we find Ruth. And I just I love the story as we get into it. So uh, we're going to read the first chapter, take our time there, 22 verses, but I think it's imperative for the, for the lesson of what we're saying tonight. So let's uh, read this. Now it came to pass in the days when the Judges ruled there in there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of the two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephraites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Ophrah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malion and Chilion died, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-laws with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her daughters-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. And they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn away, my daughters. Why will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, and if I should have a husband also tonight, and also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from the... From having husbands, nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes. The hand of the Lord is gone against me. And they lifted their voices and wept. And Ophrah kissed her mother in law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, my sister in law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister in law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whether thou goest, I will go, and whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left off speaking unto her. So they went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass that when they were come to Bethlehem, all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said, Call me not Naomi, for the for, call me Mara, for the for the Almighty hath dealt verily bitter with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter in law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. So we see a kind of a sad story there. And uh, so uh, we're going to look at the main characters here. If you want to call it an outline, the outline is this. Uh, Naomi covered up, Ophrah gave up, and Ruth stood up. 
And that's kind of that's the simple outline I've got here. Now, as we get into this, that we see that there's some uh, names. You know, names mean something. In the Bible, Bible names mean something. It, and most of our names mean something. If you study etymology, the, the history of names and names, you'd find out your name means something. Now, I kind of got into that. I like that. So if you take my name, Jerry Ellis Duncan, it's my full name. Jerry, they derived from Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah means God will uplift. I like that. Ellis is a derivative from Elijah. The Lord is my God. Duncan is a Scottish name that means brown-clad warrior. So, you know, that's a, so that's a Scottish part of me. But these names meant something. And in the Bible, they meant something. Now, understand something. This is maybe second generation, and they're in the promised land. They're where God wanted them to be. So we're talking about choices. Every person in this room tonight is a, re a, a result, some total of the choices you've made. You're a result of the choices you've made in your life. Now, as we look at these choices, I, I can only speak for myself. I look back, and I've done some pretty good choices, but I've also done some pretty stupid and dumb choices. I've paid a lot of stupid and dumb tax because of the choices that I have made. But there's some choices that God has blessed. So we, we look here, and that's what we're looking at tonight, about making choices. These folks were where they were supposed to be. It always bothers me when Christians are where they're supposed to be and they think the grass is always greener. The world has nothing to offer us but death. Oh, it paints a pretty picture. You know, we was talking the other night. He gave the example of, of alcohol commercials. Well, that's an advertising technique. If you'll notice, most all alcohol commercials are either stupid, funny, people having a good time. You know, if, if, uh, if we showed you the results of alcohol where the person's laying in the gutter and they're sick, or, or, the per, or, the, or you saw the crash where the, there's people dying, and you see the beer cans laying on the road, and, and I come on with a smiling face and I say, this Bud's for you, drink Budweiser. I think Bud's, the beer sales will go down. So, but that's a choice people make. So, so as a Christians, we've got to be careful of the choices we make. Now let's look at Naomi. You know what her name meant? Her name means pleasantness. Pleasantness. She's supposed to be a pleasant lady. Well, as we look through the, through the scripture here, that first chapter, she's anything but pleasant. And who does she blame for her problems? She blames God. How many Christians do that? Got a problem with God? It's your fault. Oh, it's God's fault. You know, it's God's fault that... This happened to our family. You know, uh, I don't know whose fault it is. You, normally, things that happen to me are my fault. You know, going back to the choices I make. Sometimes God wants me to go through things, but mo most of the things I that happen to me are because of what I did. So she's blaming God for her problems already. And at the end, she says, don't call me, uh, at the end of the chapter, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. That, that word means bitterness. Bitterness. She, had, she was full of bitterness. You know, it's sad to be bitter. bitter. Bitterness destroys you. You have to learn to let it go. You know, there's people that, that come into our lives for whatever reason. We, it, through the course of our life, they be Christian brothers and sisters, maybe very close to us. And through that, something happens, and we become bitter. They go on about their merry business. They're having a good time. Nothing's bothering them, but because of what they've done, we're still bitter. We have to learn to let go of bitterness. We have to also figure out, why am I bitter? Is it because of something I've done? Well, basically here, it's because of what her and her husband chose to do. You know, uh, his name, Elimelech, his name means, my God is king. Well, if, if he is going by his name, my God is king, and her name is Pleasant, they're in the promised land, why would they go to Moab? Now, Moab, they had to cross the Dead Sea to get there, go around the Dead Sea. Well, right there, it tells you off the fact they're leaving somewhere there's life and going to something's dead. They go, and when they go there, they lose everything because they were not where they were supposed to be. And it's interesting. But the word Bethlehem means house of bread. They were, they were where they're supposed to be. Also, it means fruitfulness. Judah means praise. So they were going to travel, and it's only 15 miles. Now, to us, 15 miles is not that far. That's either from here to Hudson or here to, to St. Pete. 
You think, well, my goodness, it could take an hour to get to either of those places cord and red lights. Yeah, but if you had to walk 15 miles, it would take you a lot further, take a lot longer. So they, they, they had to walk. And on the interstate, 15 miles, you could probably do it in seven or eight minutes. I've done it in less in a patrol car and, uh, years ago. But anyway, we won't go there. But I was to do it legally then. But the point is, it's not that far in terms of time and distance today. But then it was a long ways. You know, if you try to walk 15 miles, and it, it, it's going to take you more than an afternoon stroll. But still, they were not that far away that they couldn't have come back home. So they went to, they went to the world to solve their problems. Well, now, let's look at these two boys. Uh, Malon's name, you know what his name means? This is a good name. You know, uh, so uh, Emily Limanek, whose name is My God is King, and Naomi, hers is Pleasant, they named their son Malon, which means sickly. So he's a sickly boy, evidently. Chilion was pining, P-I-N-I-N-G. That is, means he suffered from mental or physical decline. So both these boys were having problems. You know, maybe as a result of where they got, went. You know, so we see that they chose to leave, and they chose to go to Moab. So what happens in the course of being in Moab? They lost everything. She lost her, her husband and her two boys. Now, they also, uh, they married outside the tribe. Now, uh, Mo, Mo, the Moab, Moabite people, you could marry, but they couldn't enter the, uh, I think, the tabernacle or something uh, up to about the 10th generation. There was acceptable there. But, but we'll see later on that God made a special grace time here for Ruth and stuff of what happened there. But, but, uh, but because of their choices, she lost everything. So she looks there, and she said, okay, uh, it's time to go back. I'm going back home. It seems like they're having uh, some, uh, you know, gr gr the grass is growing again, and the, the, there's food now, and it's a good time to go back. And so she decides to leave. <clears throat> and so does her daughter. So the, she realized that she'd hit rock bottom. That's like a lot of people hit rock bottom, and that's the time they start to crawl out. And that's when she started to crawl out. She was bitter. She's blaming God, but she decides to go back home. And so her daughter-in-law's they rose to go with her. So we see Ruth covering up. Now, when you see a Christian that's covering up and it's in sin, they become, they're carnal. Now, that's the worst person to give godly advice. That's the worst person you or I could go to to get advice from, from a carnal Christian. What does she do here? They're going with her, which I think is a noble thing. Evidently, she had been a good mother-in-law. Evidently, they had seen something. Maybe they had seen, he understood these two ladies understood, hey, we understand what Israel did. We understand Israel, what they had done, and God had put them in a promised land. You know, people around there understood what, how God had worked with Israel. Like I said, this is just a second generation from Joshua crossing, the, crossing over the Jordan River. So they start back. And on the way, she says, oh, go back to your homes. They said, no, we want to go with you. So, she, so, so uh, we see that Ophrah gives up. Orpha. I have a problem with that. Orpha. Anyway, but she, she went back. She went back to her gods. So we see now that she's a bad witness. It bothers me. How many people have we affected when we are away from God? You know, I'm afraid. I hate to look back in my life of when I was away from God or when, you know, what I said something or how I acted affected somebody. Now, Rightly so. Every one of us have to stand before God and give account. But still, I'm to be a witness. I'm to, I should be helping draw people there, not push them away. You know, I hate to have somebody's blood on my hands, you know, because of my actions. Because I'm responsible. I'm responsible to sow the seed. I'm responsible to let people see Christ in me, no matter what, the, what situation I'm going through. Now, listen, I, every one of us has gone through some rough situations. We've gone through some real hard times. We've gone through times that I just didn't want to talk to anybody. I prefer not to see anybody. But we have to get up. We have to, in the morning, we have to take our baths, put on our clothes. Men shave. Ladies shave, too. But we have to put our clothes on. We have to go out in the world. We have to meet the world, even when things are going bad. And that's the time they need to see God in us. When they know that no, they know we're going through the fire, they've got to say, what do they have that I don't have? That's when your walk speaks loud, more loudly than your, 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 the spoken word does. Now, 
I'm not saying you don't speak the word. I'm not saying you don't witness with the mouth. I'm saying you've got to witness with every facet of your life. We see that she didn't. So we see now that Naomi, she covered up. Ophrah, she gave up. But Ruth, she stood up. It reminds me that when we say if Ruth stood up, we see that there that uh, reminds me of my, I guess I, I have, if I have a life verse, it's Psalm 16, 8. I love 16, Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I shall not be moved. I love that verse. I think that's where, in one sense, Ruth was at. You know, sometimes we have to dig in. We, we draw a line in the sand. We're not moving. The world has to see that in us. They need to see that Christians make a stand. Now, I don't mean that we're ugly, but there's a time we have to make a stand. And we're coming to that more uh, today. Society's pushing us to do that. We, it's too many people, Christians, well, let's just be friends. Let's try to work through this. Let's try to coexist. You can't coexist. You're either saved or you're lost. The unsaved people don't like us. The world, when I say that, I'm, I'm not talking about there's, there's unsaved people I have friends with. I'm talking about world society as it is. Do not like Christianity. They have their own culture. They have their own religion. But they do not like us. There's a reason for that. We're salt. And salt, put on a wound, hurts a little bit. So but we see here that Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave or return following after me. For whether thou goest, I will go. And whether thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. So she accepted the Lord God Almighty. She had remembered. She, she had seen something. She had to know about what God had done. She had to know about what God had done with Israel when they brought them through the wilderness and what they had done to Egypt. And it was still fresh in people's minds. You know, it's, uh, let's say a, a generation. What is a generation? 20 years? Huh? 40? Okay, 40. So let's say it's that second 40 years. So that 80, maybe 80 years into the promised land? Now, I was born in 1953. World War II was very, still very fresh when I was a little boy. My dad had been part of it. Korean War was fresh. I lived through the Vietnam War. Never got there, but I lived through it. Saw that. In my town, when I was a little boy, there were still Civil War veterans there. Not many, but a few. Some of you may have known some Civil War veterans that are older than I am. Now, that's just, that means our country wasn't that old when the Civil War took place. You see where I'm trying to think? People, you could, they were still fresh on their minds, things that had happened. And I think that was fresh on her mind. So she decided to stand up and she decided to go back. In going back, what happened? God blessed. When we stand up for God, God blesses. Now, a lot of times it's not the blessings that you and I think. You know, we, today in society we think blessings. Oh, well, man, God, I got a new car and got a raise and, uh, you know, I uh, got this new house and uh, I got this and that. And those are nice. But that's not necessarily blessings that are great blessings. The blessings, I'm thinking of the blessings that affect us for eternal. And that's what we see here with Ruth. Because, you know, if you look at this chapter, this chapter ends with sadness. You know, she, uh, we see Naomi crying and saying, Hey, the Almighty hath dealt de better, uh, very bitter with me. He's afflicted me. So she's blaming this. This one sweet lady was blaming God. She was bitter. But now we see that they go back. And it's the beginning of barley harvest. Now, I'm not reading all four chapters. We're going to work ourselves toward the end. We see that through this, God provides what we call the kinsman redeemer. It, his name is Boaz. He's a type of Christ. Interesting to note, you know who Boaz's mother was? Huh? No, Rahab. Rahab. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? So, uh, I, you know, I think you know, God, God plans things. You know, it, when we, God plans our life along if we're willing to follow along and stuff. So we see here that they go back and he provides this. You can see God's working through this all the way. He's got everything set up, and, and just as God is working, he's going to bring, going to take this bitter lady and take away the bitterness, and he's going to provide what we call a kinsman redeemer. You know, she worked in the fields there. And we see here toward the end that in, uh, 
that in uh, chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Nick, this is where that, uh, the, the wheat harvest has been done. And it's very common at that time that he, he was in there in the evening. He, was, he had finished his work, and he's laying there at the end of the wheat. And uh, that's where Ruth comes in, and she's at his feet. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou, thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest. For thy, all the city of my people know that thou art a virtuous woman. That's nice. That's, that's a high compliment there. What does it say over, over about a virtuous woman? And he said, and so we know the story. Now, there was another kinsman there, and to cut through that, he bows out because he didn't want to mar his, uh, his inheritance, so to speak. And you never know his name. I thought that's interesting. God never chose to put that man's name in there. But anyway, but then, uh, so as we see that in verse 8 of chapter 4, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe, and, and that was very customary of, of buying something then. And Boaz said unto the, the elders and unto the, the, all the people, Your witnesses this day, I have brought, bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Malon's at the, of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife. So to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead uh, be not cut off from among his brethren from the gate and his place. Your witnesses this day. So uh, it says in verse 13 there, move on down. So Boaz took Ruth, she was his wife, and she went unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the, the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And, uh, and he should be likened to the restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath bore him. And Naomi took the child, and laid upon her bosom, and became a nurse unto it. So God restored some some sweetness there. God, she came back, and God blessed there. And the woman, her neighbors, gave it a name, and therefore the, uh, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed, and he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So we see here that another Gentile has been brought into the line of Christ. And we see the blessings here. I think it's part of our blessings today. You know, God blessed there. God blesses when you stay faithful. You know, you're going, we're going to go through hard times. Things is going to tear up. Things are going to happen. You know, we people are, you know, we look around, people's left the church. That happens. I do not, not, I do not like it when people leave. It bothers me. Uh, but still the fact is, things happen in life. But we need to stay focused to keep the Lord before us. And the only, uh, Ruth did that. She stood up, and God blessed it. When you cover sins, God uncovers them. You know, we, that's one thing you can't get away from doing. You, you can run to the world, and you may enjoy it for a short time, but it will, it will hit you in the face one day. And you know, what kind of witness are you? Every one of us in here, as a Christian, is required to be a witness and to share Christ with others. So I challenge you tonight. My challenge is for us to, to be like Ruth, to stand up, and, and as old Dr. Bob Jones used to say, do right. Do right. And that's my challenge tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.